Services here. Concerning the sick, Joliet Ross was released from the hospital and is at home resting. She would love cards and visitors. Uh, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., Steve Bennett was taken to Marshall County Hospital Sunday afternoon. He has since been released with a bladder infection, bladder stones, and kidney stones. Uh, Etta Borland is still very sick and would appreciate prayers. Bob Pogue was released and is at home resting. Eileen Christ is back home after a few days stay in the hospital. Kevin Young, the son of Gary Young, has cancer and is on hospice. Sore throat. Uh, the doctor said it was almost closed and was very infected. She's on bed rest and medication at this time. Uh, Roger and Pat Jarrett went for tests today. They both got good results. Uh, they're at home resting, but they still need. The J. Har J. Lockhart Pavilion. Uh, changed to 6.30 p.m. And our Sunday evening services will remain at 6 p.m. If you have a child that's away at college, please let the office know their address. Many of our members would like to send cards or care packages, and we don't want to miss anybody. And finally, attention seniors, you're invited to attend the area-wide Senior Adult Fellowship Day on Thursday, September 8 a.m. We'll provided this points to others. Sign up sheet is in the foyer. If you have any questions, ask Bob or Jane Hines. Are there any other announcements at this time? Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this. Thank you for protecting us throughout the day. At this time, we ask you to be with those who were mentioned earlier that need your healing hand. Please be with those. Our church today. And in the future, because new soul to you and our congregation. Pray that we'll be active participants and use the information that we're given to help uh, further your kingdom. At this time, we hope that our worship is acceptable unto you and bring praises to your name. And again, please forgive us when we fall short. I pray these things in Christ's name. There is a habitation built by God for all of every nation who seek that grand abode. O Zion, Zion, I long thy gaze to see. Shall ever move a stone, O Zion, Zion, I long thy gaze to see, O Zion, when shall I dwell?
next song will be Earth Holds No Treasures. Tillett Tedley wrote this poem in Sherman, Texas, the day that he was baptized. This is the very first poem he wrote after his baptism. Earth holds no to see However precious they be Yet there's a country to which I am going Heaven holds all to me Heaven holds all to me Brighter his glory will be Joy without measure Should I long for the world with its sorrow? In that home, oh, million, the wonder ever to. Good evening. You may want to turn to Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, Isaiah 52. Mental pictures or images can play an important role in the development and the sustaining of our faith. Anytime we put anything into our brain, whether it's a concept by something we've read or heard or we've seen an image form, we should always question in the sense that we want to make sure it's pleasing in God's sight to put it there in our brain. And two, we want to make sure that whatever we put in our brain is true. If we put concepts into our brain or images into that brain that are not true images or concepts, then we'll end up not being rational in our thinking and the way we feel and many times the way we act. So those two are what we put into our brain. Most of us are either concept thinkers or we're image thinkers. Now, I am a image thinker. If you came up to me and said, Jim, so-and-so just drives me up the wall. And you've probably heard that expression before. Immediately, the image that would pop into my mind is literally this person going up the wall or Jim this person as an image thinker I would visualize this person under their skin crawling on the other hand if you're primarily a concept thinker you're probably focusing on the words that the person is giving you and uh, trying to analyze the meaning behind those words 
But for most of us, we're both a concept and an image thinker. Let's turn now over to Isaiah if you're What do you visualize or what do you conceptualize when you partake of the Lord's Supper? We know this, this is a time in which we are to reflect on who God is and what God has done for us through Christ. And if we are then we have the, hopefully, the insight and the incentive to do something about it. If you are an image thinker, what images come to your mind when you're partaking of the Lord's Supper? Or if you're a concept, when you partake of the Lord's Supper? Some of you may be reading, concepting in that point, picture in your mind as the communion is, is unfolding, so you're primarily using an image. You probably don't have this particular image in mind, but I wanted to show you this to show you how benign this really is. Now back in the 1600s in Western Europe during the Renaissance, this would be your typical picture of Christ and him crucified. Something that would be very aesthetic in nature and very appealing, if you will, or not obtrusive, at least, to the eye. Not a, a, a lot of blood there, not a lot of reality, if you will, as to how the crucifixion, the crucifixion really was. This is uh, a picture from the Sistine Chapel. If you walk into the main corridor of the Sistine Chapel, which is Vatican City, uh, Rome, Italy, you will see this picture, 16th century Renaissance Western Europe painting of Christ and him crucified. Using our aesthetic to the eyes, but again, not reflecting the reality the crucifixion by the Romans. If you remember, they didn't give, the lictors didn't give Jesus 30 lashes minus one. He kept, they kept giving him lash and lash and lash. And picture, because it does not reveal the totality of the punishment that he received. It does not reflect the severity of the wounds that he sustained. And that brings us to Isaiah 52, starting with verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up. There were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond. Will he sprinkle mouths because of him? For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? To, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man and a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. When you look at this mental image, you can't, you cannot have some 
in some sense of gratitude for what Christ has done for us. Because it was and he submitted himself that at any moment he could have brought it to a halt. He was marred beyond human recognition, according to Isaiah, who wrote this 700 years. Also, studies, because when you're talking about the gospel message in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, to some people that would be primarily a concept that they're reading about. But when you can associate it with an image like this, it drives home the point of how great God loves us. And he's willing to go to any extent to save our souls. If you're an individual tonight that needs to come to the one who has sacrificed so much for you, or if you need to return back to Christ, uh, having known him at one time, but now uh, have fallen away, then this is your time as we stand and as we sing. against the light. For sinner, harden not thy heart. Be saved, O oh, tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Will thou be saved? I stubborn will be saved all tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? Will thou be saved? Miss the class.
as we get going, let's talk about upcoming announcements. Anybody who was not mentioned tonight that we need to mention? Hmm? Your sister-in-law, Shirley Jones. Okay. And we got some visitors back. We're glad you're back. Good stuff. And, okay, next Sunday night, we are going to have services outside, as long as it doesn't snow or whatever else weather happens. But uh, it'll be out there in the little pavilion. We'll have it set up, and we have a pretty good microphone to work around it and everything else. But uh, come on up. It'll be the same time it always is, 6 o'clock. But if you want to bring a lawn chair, you can. We'll have plenty of chairs for everybody. But if you like have our some of our young men reading scripture and things such as that. So come on to it. I think you'll like it. We'll have some food activities after. the uh, law of Moses and you can recall all the things we've done we've talked about the Ten Commandments the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament Old Testament is there to teach us about the nature power and history of God Romans 15 4 these that we through the patient and so we went through and we talked about the Ten Commandments in the first week and we talked about how nine of them are under the uh, New Testament, but the one that's missing is number four. And what's that one? The Sabbath day is missing. And you can find hints of the Sabbath in Hebrews 3 and 4 when we talk about Jesus being the Sabbath. And we see the rest that we have from God. Last week, we talked about the idea of the tabernacle. Anybody remember the size of the tabernacle compared to the auditorium? Okay, yeah, yeah. About as wide as the auditorium, if you start from behind the pulpit and you go back to about where the balcony starts, it's about the width. And then if you take this auditorium from that edge and you go out to the median, that's about the length that you have there. So not a huge place when you think about it serving an entire nation, but that's a pretty good-sized tent right there, isn't it? Pretty good-sized tent that you got. And, of course, it's about 15 feet tall. We spent some time talking about the placement of the tribes around the uh, place. Benjamin always was behind. They always defended the backside. If you're going to get into the tabernacle, if you're going to enter into the place of God, which tribe did you have to go through? Judah. Judah. All right. So that was some good stuff. And we talked about each one of the uh, parts of the tabernacle as far as like what it was, what it looked like when you looked at it directly. I think Carolyn needed one, Sonny. Carolyn wept. She's got one already. Look at you. All right. Did you buy that off the black market over there? Okay. All right. All right. (laughs) Three in your hand. That's why I ran out. That's what it was. Uh, It's a little bit different than last week. This one has more pictures, I think. But um, we talked about each of the uh, parts of it. The outer court, where any Jewish male could go. Uh, we talked about the uh, different parts. I think we got to the bronze altar, and that may have been as far as we got. That was seven days ago. I don't remember exactly. This is where all the sacrifices went on. And here in a few weeks, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about sacrifices and what they look like. But the bronze altar was the very first thing you saw when you went in. Next, if you went a little further, you'd run across a laver or a sink is the word we would use. About 15 feet across, it was a big sink. And each priest would have to bathe or sprinkle his hands and his feet. So at least the tradition of Jewish washing. But the priests would always be cleaning themselves before they did any task. And so if you were a Jewish man, what you would see with the temple was you would see a lot of the um, priests back into the tabernacle. You would see a lot of or the holy place. You'll see a lot of people coming in and out around the, uh, where the altar is also. They had tables, six on either side of the altar, which held much of the, um, the meat, which had been sacrificed and having those things ready to go as they were taking out the entrails and different things such as that. And so you'd see that. Yes, sir, Gerald? Weren't you said it was washing the hands and feet? 
and feet, yes. Yeah, they wash their hands and their feet. And so, uh, much like what you see in Isaiah 6, you see it's, it's a copy of covering their hands and their feet, or covering their head and their feet. And so, as you looked at the tabernacle, 15, 45 feet long. So you have the 30 feet by 15 feet. Now within the tabernacle, you have three things, right? What you would do, and Tyler brought this up to me last week, but he promised not to bring it up during the book of Hebrews, and sometimes the uh, altar of incense is inside the tabernacle. Back and forth, and people always say, well, which one was it? Well, it made so much smoke, it was hard to tell sometimes. I think it was right on the outside. That's what I get. The Hebrew writer talks about it being inside, or at least the effect of it being inside. That's one of those things people like to argue about. But if you're with me, and we walked right into the tabernacle, right there at the curtain is this altar of incense. Now, you would have all the sacrifices going on. What happened at the kind of perfume? It gives the uh, gives a formula to it, and it says if anybody wears this perfume, they have to be put to death. But it makes sacrifices would be made, they would take the blood, and they would pour it over that, and then they would burn it, and that would go above the temple as well. So both of those were going on. So you would have to travel through that smoke and through that veil to get into that area. Once you got in, on one side, you'd have the table of showbread, which would be on the other side. Loaves? Twelve loaves. Good job. Okay. One that represented each tribe of Israel. And then also, they were, they were replaced every Sabbath day, and the priest would be able to eat them. Now, a lot, there's a lot of question, and we won't spend a lot of time on it. David, remember when he was running away from Saul, was famished. Remember, he ate some of the loaves. That's, I guess, where we read about the table of showbread more often than anywhere else, uh, trying to the other side you have what the menorah or the lampstand right sometimes people say it's a candlestick the thing is they didn't have candles back at that time they were oil lamps generally is what you would see there now in Hanukkah when they reestablished the temple remember one of the reasons why they reestablished it was because they're going against and re-putting in their nation again what happened days and what kept going on It burned even longer than the oil should have let it. And so that's a Jewish tradition and one of those things that they'll play with a lot of times. And one of the reasons why they use that as their um, symbol. Oftentimes Jewish people will. But that's 30 by 15. Now the very inside part is called the what? The most holy place. And it is a perfect cube. Okay? 15 feet, 15 feet, 15 feet. And so it's perfect. Temple, uh, the last a lot of cubes and everything. When did they get to go in here? One day a year, right? Day of Atonement. Who got to go? The high priest would enter in, and so it was filled with. You were not the high priest, and he would go and he would offer the blood upon what's called the mercy seat. And we run across that word mercy seat sometimes in our church songs. Okay, can you think of any church song that says mercy seat? Okay, maybe we don't sing those songs very often. But uh, the mercy seat is the top of the temple between the two seraphim which are there. And uh, he would go in there once a year and he'd offer it. Okay, now the fun part of covering the tabernacle. And this is a lot more fun than what we did before because it's not so many numbers. I want us to, in today's lesson, tonight's lesson, which we'll get there here in just a second, to really look at each part of the temple and see how it relates to Jesus or the new covenant. And there's a ton of analogies which are here. Sometimes you got to be careful because we, we pull analogies a little bit too much. There's a preacher called Chrysum or Chrysum uh, from the early centuries who uh, loved to get to parables and he would find 
every part of that parable, and he'd say it represented something. When a good Samaritan was going and he fell down, he must have represented this, and, you know, which they didn't have cable TV back then. I think that's what it was. But um, a lot of times you just have all sorts of things. So we get started. It's difficult to read up here. The worship at the tabernacle, you see in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8, where God tells Moses, he says, let them build a sanctuary, let them build a sanctuary, and I shall dwell in their midst. And he says this three times in that chapter. You build this tabernacle, I will be there. This will be the place where they will come and they will see God. Now, remember, they had just left Egypt. Remember, Aaron had made a golden calf, which was just like the gods that they'd worshipped in Egypt. And people like to make a religion of what they've just left a lot of times. And so here we are, and throughout the tabernacle days and throughout the temple days in the Old Testament, if you're a Jewish man or Jew person, you would go to the tabernacle to see the presence of God. That's where you did your sacrifices primarily. Right? Now, what's interesting about that is you pull back. We got to. Stephen preached the sermon. Now, usually we focus on Stephen standing up and Stephen preaching, but we don't really talk about the sermon very much. But we talk about how, you know, they grit their teeth at the end and they stone him and put him to death. And he says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Read the last paragraph of his sermon. He goes through the history of Israel. You read the last paragraph of his sermon. He says, we've got a God who lives in a temple not made with hands. And he starts quoting out of the book of Psalms. And he starts making the point, God is not in this temple because God is not kept inside of a building. God is not in any certain location. God is everywhere. The earth, the entire earth is his footstool. All right? It's not a contradiction. What you see in the Old Testament is... God made the old covenant in a way in which these Jewish folks, when everything in the world was falling apart, when they were in the wilderness and all their friends are dying because of their uh, unbelief, there's always one constant in the middle of the camp, and that's God. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Now, when you get to the New Testament, what was the argument against Christianity? Well, it destroyed the temple, destroyed the old law. It destroyed that idea of the Jewish people being the keepers of God because suddenly it started going to all people. And suddenly Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so that's one of the reasons why these Jewish folks really didn't like what Stephen had to say. They were very, very upset. Now, if you want to read that in a much more eloquent way, in a better way, F.F. F. Bruce's commentary in the book of Acts. It's in our church library, but uh, read that. He does the best treatment of that sermon, I think, of all of our uh, brethren or all the folks who have written good commentaries on the book of Acts. So F.F. F. Bruce, in his commentary, does a pretty good job with that. Now, we spend some time really quickly, and we're going to spend a lot more time when we get over to the priest. You have two groups of people. You have the, the sons of Levi, right? The sons of Levi have the job of doing things around the temple uh, and doing things throughout the nation. They're going to run the, uh, they're going to run the uh, cities of refuge and get to that area. Circle, but each is ended by a tribe of Levites, by a group of Levites. And each group of Levites has a responsibility when they move to carry certain parts. Some of them will carry it on ox carts, the actual articles of the temple. They'll carry it on the pole system, like we oftentimes hear about the ark and everything else. But it's really interesting when you go through and you see what each one of these folks did. Uh, Aaron had several sons. The first two died. The other two are who made up the priesthood. We'll see that each one of those has a role or has a job. And each one points back to Jesus. Now, remember how many sons did Jacob have? Okay, now the which is hard to figure out because Judah was which number? He was a fourth son, right? Okay, you don't have Reuben, and a lot of times we don't look at that very closely. We try to figure out what in the world went on. Remember, Reuben and Simeon and and they lost the birthright, so the oldest was going to be Judah. 
Now, when Moses came down from the mountain and began to persecute the people because they were following the uh, golden calf, the Levites are the ones who gathered around Moses and exerted the uh, punishment upon the nation. And so Levi, in the Old Covenant, turned out to be the people of God. They turned out to be the priest. But in the New Covenant, you see the tribe of Judah, which is there. You read all of that in Genesis chapter 50, if you're looking at the, the prophecies which go across. All right. Now to more interesting stuff, I think. Let's look at each part. And this is very subjective. And so when you think of something else that these represent, or you think of something because the odds of you being right instead of me are really, really high. I am the parent of two teenage boys, and so I have been corrected before. All right? So let, let's go ahead and have a discussion, even if it is in the auditorium, about what each one of these means. I think the bronze altar, the, uh, yeah, I think the bronze altar represents the cross. Uh, Exodus 40 and verse 29 Put the offering before the door of the tabernacle, offered on it the burnt offering and grain offering as the Lord has commanded. Okay? In John 12, 32, Jesus speaks of how when he's lifted up, he'll draw all people to himself. Sacrifice, which he would give. When we get here in a few weeks to go to the sacrifices, Leviticus 1 through 4, you'll see from the grain sacrifice, from the uh, atonement sacrifice, each one of these sacrifices represents another aspect of the death of Jesus. Stood there. What else do you think that could represent? You got any ideas? Okay. It'll get more varied as we go through. Now, what's interesting, you walk the tabernacle, what's the very first thing you see? It's this altar, right? Now, what is the way into the church? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You cannot enter. And so that's the very first aspect that you see if you're going to become a New Testament Christian is you have to obey there. All right? Now, here's the sink. The sink oftentimes will have many different views as we look there. Uh, the, we talked about this a little bit last week, if you remember. Nexus 30, 18 through 21 is where it comes up, talking about the labor, about washing the priest's hands and their feet. Now, there's an argument sometimes used by this. This is the point at which baptism, uh, uh, looking as far as a new birth. Now, you got a problem with that. Problem number one is this is not immersion. The, the priests were not diving into this thing, right? They were just sprinkling or pouring water on their hands in a very ceremonial way. And so it defers from baptism in that way. Another way I think it defers from baptism is the idea that it's past the death. It's, you have to be inside the tabernacle before you're baptized if that's the way that you look at this. So I think a better way to look at it is the cleansing and a washing of us by the word. Look at 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. You don't have to literally look because you had that verse memorized, right? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Cleanses us, washes us from all sins. And so what you see there in John's writings is he says, as long as you're in Christ and as long as you're walking in the light, you have that cleansing effect by the blood of Christ. Sometimes we have messed up, I think, because we have emphasized the danger of sin so much and the wages of sin is death. We've got to emphasize that sin. Some people have emphasized the wages of sin is death so much that we have, I could say, I've been lost six times today. Okay, because hey, I, I had a bad thought about something, you know. I was in the hospital, and there was all that about a year when my kids' kids are grown up, right? Well, I think, okay, I'm lost until I say, Dear Lord a little further and then something will happen to me and I'll get angry at them and then I think okay I'm lost until I say dear Lord please forgive me 
And then something else will happen. And so we think we go through a day and we're lost six times, we're saved six times, maybe you're lost 20 times, maybe you've been really good today, you've been lost three times. Is that the way it works? No, it's not. When we talk about sin causing death, it's more of a practice of sin in our life rather than one that's what 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 is telling us. Now, I've got a whole sermon on this, but I don't have time for a whole sermon tonight. So I'm giving you the Cliff Notes version. But you and I have to live a practice of godliness. Now, that does not excuse sin. It does not make it where it's okay to sin a little bit because God's grace is just going to cover it. Shall we, sin that God, shall we sin that grace may abound? Who have died to sin live any longer in it. It cannot be a habit. But we're saved by the continual washing of Christ as long as we are walking in that light. Okay, any comment on that one? Man, I love teaching in the auditorium class. Love it. All right. Now, this other one, I'm probably wrong on it. So think about this for a little bit. That outer court where the... Uh, where where we're looking at the idea of the laborer at the sink, which is there. I've written down, it represents the world. Now you can say somewhere else when I get to the tabernacle. This is the opportunity we have to uh, interact with people in the world. Okay, We show them Christ crucified when we show them where the altar is. Okay, so the world is represented by that outer court. Anybody can enter and they can look at the parts of the church. They can look at the doctrines of Christ even if they don't participate. Now, the reason I said that is because I think this first veil here, and this is the veil that leads into the tabernacle, represents, I think here's where we see the idea of baptism. Remember, you had to be one of God's people in order to enter into the tabernacle, right? This was not open up to anybody. You had to be one of the priests, I guess would be a better way to say it. Any Israelite could be in the outside, could be around to see those things. They could not operate the sacrifices, could not operate the bathing, but they could be in the outer temple to see those things. But only a priest could enter through that curtain. So I think that would represent the idea of baptism. Uh, what, yes, ma'am. Jerry? I think so. I've looked. I've had trouble finding that. Her question is, could the women enter into the outer court? I think they can. Now, when you get to the temple, especially Herod's temple is where we read about it more in the book of Luke, you see that there is a court of women. The court of women and the Gentiles, the court of men, as you go in closer and closer. I think the tabernacle, you could have men and women, but I don't know that for sure. But I think you could. All right, now you get to this tabernacle, you have to go through that curtain. And you are in that curtain, or you're outside the curtain. You had to be a priest to enter in, okay? And so I think that that would represent baptism. John chapter 3 and verse 5, you must be born of water and what? The Spirit to see the kingdom of God. Now you talk to a denominational guy, and they're going to say that refers to baptism. Or not baptism, they're going to say that refers to the physical birth. If you've watched many births, you have not seen a lot of water necessarily. Yes, the water breaks, but that's not really what occurs at the birth of a child. And the idea of water birth didn't come until several centuries after Jesus and Nicodemus were talking. Jesus is talking about baptism here. There's a physical part and there's a spiritual part that happens when we're added to the Lord's church. We see the physical. And the physical is the washing of the word, or at least we are baptized. And the spiritual is we are cleansed with the blood of Christ. And so you must be born of the Also Acts 2.38. For the remission of your sins, you will seek the gift of the Lord. Seven, a little bit later, those who are being saved. And we see that includes the 3,000 people who are baptized. So I think that curtain represents the entrance or the adding of us 
to the church. Yes, sir. And we're all priests. And we're all priests. There's a uh, universal priesthood in the church. Looking over 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Excellent point. Excellent point. Okay, any other comment? All right. Okay. And so the holy place, the church. Okay, so as we're in there, we see that cleansing which has occurred and have as we go. Now we get to a little bit more of the, uh, the uh, mm, what's it mean sort of things. Okay, the lampstand. You can make the lampstand mean a lot of things. What I've written down tonight, at least here, is I think the lampstand represents Christ and the gospel. Now, recognize something, and you will if you read much of what I write. I am not inspired, and I make a whole lot of mistakes. And so this is my supposition of what I think each part represents. So if you have another idea, you are welcome. But I think that lampstand represents the gospel of Christ. We talked about last week about how this lampstand filled a very important role within this tabernacle. Because if you have four series of skins and linen covered, what are you going to do about light? Light's not going to come through a porpoise skin. It's not going to come through dyed ram skin. And it's not going to make it through those two fabrics. And so the only source of light to be able to see where you're getting around within the church, within this tabernacle, is that lampstand. And so I think it represents the gospel. The gospel enlightens us and helps us to see around, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. We see, well, a little bit later than that, we see that how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. We see also, some people think that this lampstand could represent the life of a Christian. Because Jesus said, what about our light? We're the light of the world, okay? And so we show our light to everybody who's around. Christian life, I, I like to go with this being the idea of the word of God. Christ and the gospel, which is there. Okay? All right, the showbread. All right, the showbread also represents Christ when we look at it. What did Jesus say about himself in the book of John? I am the, what? I am the bread of life. And that's usually where we go. The idea of him giving sustenance to the Christian again, right? Now, when you go to that passage of John, we have a temptation, a temptation of saying that that is referring to the Lord's Supper, where Jesus says, you must partake of me. You must, he who eats of me will never hunger. I don't think Jesus there is talking about the Lord's Supper. He's talking about us being just like Christ. Uh, those of the Catholic faith oftentimes will look at that duration, which is there. I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. We don't literally eat the flesh of Christ. When Jesus was saying that, he was saying that we partake of him. Kind of a you are what you eat sort of analogy, right? Which is a very scary thought if we are what we eat, right? Very scary thought. <laughs> okay. Going a little bit further, you see the altar of incense. Now remember, you've got two different altars. The altar at the front... And here I am pointing around here like this is a thousand. ...are put to death. ...entrance of the holy place. It is the one that puts out all the... ...in the worship of the Lord's church. Okay? The inner veil is the entrance to Christ. What happened in the book of Mark to that veil when Jesus was crucified? It was torn. We have free access now to God, don't we? And then, of course, the Holy of Holies represents God's presence. And the mercy seat, which is the top, represents, and I kind of left it blank because there's about six different things. But I talk slow enough where I don't have to tell you I don't know. All right? Okay. Thanks for being here, and I look forward to seeing you Sunday.